Well, last night's dynamite, you know, it ended on a very talkable note. There's no doubt about that. I mean, for anybody that saw AEW Dynasty, you all saw the return. I mean, pretty much it was foreshadowed, it was foreshadowed and everything that Jack Perry, formerly Jungle Boy, was going to make his return uh, to AEW after eight months away. And the reason he was gone for eight months is because, of course, the whole all-in 2023 backstage incident with CM Punk, which you know caused CM Punk to quit, get fired, whatever you want to believe, and for Jack Perry to be suspended for an indefinite amount of time. Now, obviously the suspension was over uh, back at the beginning of this year, and Jack Perry made his return at New Japan, at one of the New Japan shows uh, here in the States. It was in San Jose, actually, Battle of the Valley. So Jack made his return, became a member of the House of Torture, which is a spinoff of the Bullet Club out in Japan, and basically this all led people to speculate that he was on his way back to AEW eventually. And in response to CM Punk saying what he did on the MMA Hour, AEW and Tony Khan, they decide, okay, we're going to respond and we're going to use this as an angle for the Young Bucks in their upcoming match with FTR and then go from there. And that's what they did. You know, they had uh, Jack Perry, you know, roam around in the crowd. Somebody actually filmed it where he was roaming around in a sting mask. Excuse me, there, he was roaming around in a sting mask holding a you know, a bucket of popcorn or a cup of popcorn. And then when the time was right, he jumped, uh, he jumped the guardrail and basically tipped the ladder over just as FTR is going to win. And then as he's being restrained by the cops, by security, the sting mask gets taken off and it's revealed that it's Jack Perry. But why was Jack Perry brought back in this manner? Well, obviously, to, you know, align himself with the elite. So that's now two factions he's a part of in wrestling. House of Torture in Japan, and now the elite in AEW. So what happened last night to bring this all, you know, full scale? Well, basically what happened last night is Jack Perry and the Bucks and Okada, they arrive in separate vehicles. You know, the Bucks tell security, hey, Perry's with them, and basically they build throughout the night that Jack Perry might be getting reinstated by Tony Khan, and that this is going to happen in the ring. And surprise, surprise, it ends up being the last image, you know, that we see, or the last segment we see, the main event segment, if you will, uh, that we see on Dynamite. So Jack Perry's in the ring tries to play up the crowd, you know, you know, get the sympathy, you know, try to act like a baby face. You got the crowd actually behind him and them kind of serenading him with Cry Me a River. And he talks about all the great moments he's had in Jacksonville and, and all that. And he calls Tony Khan out to the ring to try to bury the hatchet, if you will, quote unquote, to get reinstated and start anew to change the world for the better. Tony Khan comes out, smiles, you know, just like he always does, you know, very awkwardly, comes out. Jack Perry talks, you know, talks up AEW, how great it is, and Tony Khan agrees, and basically tells Tony, reinstate me, you know, shake my hand, reinstate me, and we can make this all, you know, for the better. So Tony Khan shakes his hand, embraces him. Jack Perry looks towards the hard cam with a, sm with a smug smirk on his face. And just as he's raising Tony's hand again towards the ha hard cam, that's when Jack Perry lays him out with a punch to the gut with the microphone. Everybody got a kick out of this. They, some even say they kind of laughed at the way that Tony sell sold it, kind of tumbling to the ground like he got deflated like a balloon. And then the elite come out. They hold Tony up and everything. They're asking Jack, what are you doing? This wasn't part of the plan. They hold him up, and it looks like they're going to give him 
what is formerly known as the, you know, the uh, elite trigger or the V trigger or the double V trigger, whatever you want to call it. They call it the EVP trigger now. But Okada says, no, 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 don't do that. But then Okada signals for up. And then what do the Bucks do? The Bucks turn Tony upside down into basically the position of a tombstone. And you have Nick Jackson come off the, I think it's Nick Jackson, come off the second rope or the second turnbuckle. And they hit a, oh no, it's a, is it the top or second one of them? Basically, he comes off the top turnbuckle, we'll put it that way. And he hits, and they, you know, he, Nick, Matt, they hit basically the Meltzer driver, or as they call it now, the Tony Khan driver, or whatever they're calling it, basically laying Tony Khan out. Then you have Jack Perry, you know, flipping off the crowd, playing heelish to them now. You have Matt Jackson, you know, mockingly telling thank, you know, telling uh, Jacksonville, thank you for a great night and everything, and go home safe in a very mocking manner. Even saying, you know, it was a great show, great show, and you know, very mockingly, and then going behind, going backstage. They had a video up on AEW's Twitter where you had the Bucks. It was an exclusive. The, you had the Bucks, Perry and Okada come through. Perry looks into the camera and says, you took, and he's telling Tony Khan this because he knows Tony's going to watch. He says, you took eight months away from me. You got exactly what you deserve. And then Mac Jackson sarcastically is like, you know, Tony Khan is the best, you know, boss I've ever worked for. But what we did out there today or tonight, you know, need to, need to be done to get AEW back on track. You have Nick Jackson saying that was the final play. And that the elite has arrived. The elite has arrived, or as a lot of people are dubbing them, the new elite. And, you know, capitalize on the word new. But yeah, basically they, Nick says the elite has arrived, and then that's it. And while this is happening, you have the roster finally come out. You have all the mid to upper mid cards. Some of the main event guys come out to check on Tony. And you have, and you have, I'm trying to find the right word to say here. You have Shad Khan. That's right, Shad, you know, Shad Khan. That's S-H-A-D. Shad Khan. Tony Khan's dad show up in the ring for the first time on AEW television. He's got this concerned look on his face about what just happened. And I guess this was big enough of an angle that it got the NFL's attention. Because even the NFL, even the NFL reported, you know, what happened to Tony. So I guess it's a big enough angle because, you know, it's a big enough angle, I should say, because, you know, Tony Khan is not just the owner of AEW, but he's also a co-owner. You know, he's a co-owner of the Jacksonville Jaguars, who tonight are going to be selecting some of the draft picks, you know, in this year's 2024 NFL draft. So, you know, they talked about that. You know, they, you know, they basically question, you know, what his, you know, what his status is going to be and everything. And I can tell you, if Tony doesn't wear a neck brace, if he gets shown on camera, then it shows that he's not selling what happened to him and that it basically will make AEW look foolish. Uh, but anyway... But anyway, like I said, you have Shad Khan, Shad Khan out there. That's S H A D. You have Shad Khan out there, you know, looking concerned and everything. And what's interesting about this is everybody is making this. Even I said this in a super chat to Solomon Monster last night. I basically said that everybody is making this out to be very similar to the NWO. You know, I mentioned to Solid Monster in the Super Chat that, you know, they, you know, I mentioned to him about the exclusive on Twitter that the, uh, the elite did and that what Perry said about what he did to, why he did what he did to Tony Khan, you know, what the Young Bucks said as to why they did it. And I said it sounds NWO-like. It sounds very NWO-like. And everybody's making, and again, everybody's making that comparison due to the fact that here you have a group of wrestlers, you know, one that basically is now looked at as an outsider, has not officially, officially, as far as we know, been reinstated 
I mean, by a handshake and a hug, you know, doesn't say much. But basically, here you have this group of outsiders with one that's still looked at, oh, not outsiders, but you have this group of wrestlers, one of them that's looked at as an outsider because of, you know, the way he's portrayed, you know, being dubbed the scapegoat and everything, you know. And people are making the comparison to NWO. You know, people are making that comparison. I mean, people are looking at the fact that Okada could be looked at as kind of a leader because he ordered the Bucks to lift Tony Khan up and give him the Meltzer driver. Someone could be looking at Perry as being the Hogan. We, we don't know. We don't know what the direction is going to be. But apparently, it feels like to a lot of folks that we're getting another, you know, another uh, basically... You know, AEW versus, you know, uh, versus hostile takeovers or takeoverers, if you will. AEW versus hostile takeoverers um, like story. Well, I wouldn't say AEW, but I I would say basically, I would say basically we have another wrestling promotion versus invaders, outsiders, hostile takeovers, if you will, a storyline. But this time it's AEW that's doing it. Now, look, AEW obviously is no strangers to this because they had, you know, they attempted something. Let's not hide this, okay? They attempted something uh, when they did America's Top Team. Yeah. Remember them? They tried something like that. It didn't work. Because basically, all they did is have the guy that spoke basically, you know, do what everybody else is doing and, w, you know, do what others like Jim Cornette and even Ronda at that time were doing. And that's basically trying to expose the business. So nobody really bought into it, you know. Nobody really bought into it. And... You know, and ever since then, you haven't seen really anything outside of that. I mean, you might have had a little bit of an AEW versus TNA situation during the pandemic and all that to help each other out. That's fine. But outside of that, there was no real hostile takeover situation. There was no NWO-style, like, storyline uh, to go to. You know, that AEW, oh, that AEW would go to, I should say, to, you know, get attention, they did, because they didn't need to. AEW had all the components they needed, whether they were good or bad, you know, to get people watching and get people talking. They did. But yet, I guess they're so desperate now for viewership and for attendance numbers and everything and ratings that they feel they need to go down this rabbit hole. And, and what's crazy is um, Alex... Just Alex did a uh, recording. He didn't do a live stream because he's kind of called that off right now when it comes to AEW. But Alex did a he did a recording on his thoughts on Dynasty and mostly this angle. And he made a comparison to TNA. And this is before TNA got bought by Anthem. And even afterwards, you know, they went down this rabbit hole once again. But it, thankfully, it didn't last long. And now it feels like... It feels like they're kind of bouncing back. Like they got their factions and all that. They got they got the main heel faction in the system, but they're not trying to do a hostile takeover kind of deal, you know. Because the system's reasoning is to basically use, you know, the I guess you could say the system that is known as, you know, behind the scenes, the politics and everything uh, of TNA against them, not to take them over, but to give TNA a taste of their own medicine of hey. We're taking what you're using against us against you. There's no hostile takeover. There's no hostile takeover. It's just a group of people wanting to give the promotion and those behind the scenes a taste, you know, a taste of their own medicine of, hey, you want to use the system against us? We're going to use it against you. So there's no, no like hostile NWO-like vibes there. But yet, but, but yet you're getting it here. Excuse me. You're getting it here apparently, with this whole new elite, as they're called, in the, in, you know, and their uh, attack on Tony Khan. And, and, you know, what worries people about this, 
what worries people about this is Tony Khan's going to end up being something that he swore he would never be. And that's a reoccurring character. He said three years ago in an interview, you know, and this is when I guess they're going to be five years, right? So this is like when AEW was two years old. He swore he'd never be a reoccurring character. He would not do, you know, he would not pull and do a Vince McMahon. He would not pull and do an Eric Bischoff or anything like that. He would be someone that just was behind the scenes and that's it. And after seeing what happened last night, that's what a lot of people are worried about. But, again, outside of that, they make the comparison to the NWO because they've seen companies go down this path. And like I was saying about Alex making the comparison to TNA, you know, prior to the Anthem buyout and, like I said, just a bit afterwards, but then, you know, that, and then, but that didn't last long either. You know, prior to the Anthem buyout and, you know, like I said, a little afterwards with their little thing with, you know, GFW and stuff, you never once, you never once really saw a hostile takeover storyline. I mean, the last one we actually saw, excuse me, the last one we actually saw was after Tony Khan bought out Ring of Honor and some of the uh, talents that were once part of the original Ring of Honor, you know, were invading, you know, TNA, you know, that being the kingdom, that being Vincent, you know, and they were aligning them, and you have... Eddie Edwards aligned with them and be, kind of be the leader, the Hogan, if you will. But that didn't last long. That didn't last long at all. I mean, yeah, it got people's attention. It got them to tune in, there's no doubt. But it didn't make, how do I put it? It didn't make a significant spike, if you will. It didn't make a significant spike in the ratings. You know, as much as TNA, or as they were known at the time, Impact would have liked. You know? And it all culminated with a match at Slammiversary, I believe, of Team TNA versus Arno No More. And Team TNA won. And that was pretty much the end of Arno No More at that time. They tried to keep it a unit, but over time, it didn't, it didn't last any longer. It just went, you know, to the wayside, and that was it. So that was the last, that was the last time TNA ever went down that well. It was the last time. But I want you to think about this, too. You know, I want you to think of the time frame of between when they did that with Honor No More and, you know, GFW, Global Force Wrestling. There was a long stretch of time, but several years, several years, you know, that they did something like that. And yet here they were doing it once again because, hey, they want to get attention on the product during a time where basically we're slowly getting out of a worldwide pandemic. And some people, some fans are being invited back in to, you know, watch events. You know, so you need something that's going to get their attention. And, yeah, they, you know, on the Honor No More storyline did exactly that. But the point I'm getting at, the point I'm getting at is TNA has never really had to rely on that as much as they used to. Now, do I believe they might go down that route again down the line? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. But I don't think they're going to try to, you know, do it, you know, in a manner to where, they feel they're desperate for attention, so they need, you know, some kind of substance. No. I think when the time is right, they will do it. It's just a matter of when and where. Now, with that said, going back to, like I said, what Alex, just Alex, of Alex's world pointed out, you know, when he made that comparison, from what I understand, it's mainly because TNA, you know, prior to the Anthem buyout, you know, would go down this route several times. They would. Sometimes, you know, sometimes they go down this route back to back to back. It's like you get one NWO-inspired like storyline done, but then here comes another. And it's like, you know, you know, basically it's like, you know, they didn't know exactly, you know, what to do next from a storyline perspective. They didn't have something planned out post-invasion um, storyline that they were going with. They didn't. I mean, I'll give you this. They did a storyline where they had a lot of foreign wrestlers from Canada, you know, uh, you know, the Middle East and so on and everything, UK, and you had them align, you know, together as, I think, what was it, the World Empire or something like that, and they were going up against TNA, and they were doing this at the same time, 
you know, that you had the main event mafia going up against TNA. Yeah. You had the main event mafia and the world elite. I guess, I think that's what they were called, world elite. I'm not really sure. You know, simultaneously, you know, inv- trying to take over TNA, simultaneously, you know, you know, but of their own agenda. That was the storyline. Both wanted to take control. And then, of course, they came together, had an alliance. That didn't last. But still, you had these two separate entities, factions, at the same time trying to take control of TNA. Main Event Mafia, Main Event Mafia, you know, at first just, you know, ended up being a stable of, you know, guys that were former world champions or potential world champions, you know, that would fit, you know, fit the mold that they will, you know, that would, you know, come together and fit the mold of what they were looking for because they would feel disrespected by the younger generation or the newer generation at that time. And their, their goal was basically to beat respect out of the younger generation of that roster. You know, they didn't have no intent to really take over. They didn't. You know, they didn't have no real intent to take over. But then over time, but over time, you had the mafia basically start to wane a little bit. That storyline start to wane. So what did they do? They decided, okay, well, we need to go and have the mafia try to take control of TNA. And that's what they did. You know, that's what they did. Now, with that said, after that ran its course, after that ran its course, along with the World Elite um, group, you had basically, excuse me, you had basically, you know, a little break. You had a little bit of a break, and then you got Immortal. Then you ended up getting Immortal, which was basically NWO, but without the NWO name and the NWO logo. You had the Immortal logo, yes, but it was basically NWO. But, it, you know, it was basically the NWO TNA-fied, if you will, TNA-fied. That's what you had. And, you know, I'll give them credit. They, they did it in a way that was different. It did get people talking because you basically had Hogan and Bischoff manipulate Dixie Carter into signing over control of the company to her. But apparently... Apparently, people, you know, even though it started off, you know, quick and fast and had momentum, excuse me there, people started to see through the fact that, oh, this is just NWO, you know, TNA-fied. That's all it is. It's NWO TNA-fied. And they knew it was NWO TNA-fied when you had Ric Flair's Four Horsemen-inspired group, Fortune, join up with them and then turn against them. And the reason Fortune turned against them is mainly because, you know, the people they wanted to come in and help, you know, had decided to go back to WWE. That was Booker T and Kevin Nash. So, you know, the plans to get that, you know, those guys back together, you know, as a babyface main event mafia went out the door. You know, they went out the door. So they had to turn the Fortune, the TNA originals, if you will, to go against the Immortal. You know, you had to have a group defect, or, uh, defect from within to fight against them. And that right there is when you knew not only was this NWO-inspired immortal f- uh, storyline started to, you know, run its course, but now you have, but now you have basically TNA, uh, the writers basically relying on the fact that, well, we couldn't, you know, get the mafia the way we wanted. How do we, how do we salvage this? And they salvaged it by having, like I said, Fortune, who was a group with, you know, who was a group within Immortal, part of Immortal, basically, you know, turn against them. Now, I admit, it was a, now, I admit, it, they did it, you know, pretty well. They t- did it in a way that was very salvageable, but you could tell that the storyline was wearing down. It was. It was wearing down to the fact, you know, that they had to rely on Fortune being the baby faces, instead of, you know, gathering a group of talent together outside of Immortal that would be part of TNA to fight against them. But you even knew Immortal was falling apart, too, when all of a sudden they started having people that fought against them joining them. Yeah. You had people like Kurt Angle, who was fighting against them, he joined them. You had Scott Steiner, who was fighting against them, he joined them. You had Mr. Anderson, a.k.a. Mr. Kennedy, who was fighting against them, he joined them. You know, 
all because of the fact that the storyline was wearing thin and they needed to try to eject new life into it to keep people's investment going until Bound for Glory that following year. I mean, I mean, it doesn't help that, yes, Jeff Hardy's drug abuse got to him and basically put a, you know, a, you know basically put a twist in, you know, you know, a twisting dagger into the back and into the Hardy Memorial at Victory Road in 2011. There's no doubt about that. You know, that didn't help. But even if that was, but even if that didn't happen, the signs were there that it was, you know, running, that it was running thin on its course. That people pretty much were done with it. You know, they were done. You know, they didn't want to see no more. They wanted it to end. And, you know, it kept going. Give them credit, it kept going. It did. You know, because even after Bound for Glory 2011, they kept it going. They kept it going afterwards, and it didn't officially end until lockdown 2012. And that was it. That was the end. But if you think TNA didn't, but if you think TNA wouldn't, you know, go down this angle again, it wasn't even a few months after Immortal died, you know, Immortal officially died, excuse me there. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't until a few months after Immortal died, you know, that storyline was done and kaput, that they went with the Aces and Aces storyline. And yeah, they did a good job with it, don't get me wrong. You know, the twist in terms of who was who and all that, and the shocking revelations, as they would call it. You know, and even having a, a member within, you know, TNA management and stuff. But, but still, it was like, you know, after a while, you know, even that ran its course. Even when they tried ejecting life into it by revealing Bully Ray as the leader of Ace and, Aces and Eights and him being the one behind everything, you know, yeah, it kind of revamped it a little bit. But over time, even after that revelation, it started to run its course. You know, and it wouldn't be till the end of the year that pretty much they killed it off. I mean, they would, I mean, they had freaking Anderson fight against them, then join them, then get kicked out, and be the one responsible for ending them officially. I mean, it, I mean, come on, it's like, you know, I get TNA was desperate for ratings and viewership, but people were seeing through what was going on, not just with Immortal, but with Aces and Eights. And yeah, give them credit. Those you know, storylines had you know differences, you know that you know differences in them that differentiated them from NWO from being a direct NWO you know ripoff. Excuse me, there, but people could see through it. They could see through it. They can. And then when they did the GWF thing after the Anthem acquisition, when they did the Global Force Wrestling thing. You know, it's like, okay, maybe becoming Global Force Wrestling is going to help them. That didn't help. People didn't buy into it. So what did they do? They decided to go Team TNA versus Team GFW. And at the end of the day, that pretty much went up in smoke. Because GFW was already done as a promotion at that time. You know, the point I'm getting at by talking about all this is the fact that people did not expect AEW to go down this route. You know, they didn't. They didn't expect him to go down this route. Even when they decided to make the elite, the Bullet Club elite, if you want to call it, a few years ago, you know, when Anderson and Gallows was, you know, you know the good brothers were wandering about and everything and, and all that. You know, even, even when they made them, even when they came in and aligned themselves with the Bucks, you know, and everything, and, and Kenny Omega and all that, and they became this NWO-like, you know, faction, they weren't trying to take over. No, they were just trying to prove they were the most dominant group and dominant set of wrestlers, you know, not just in AEW and, and TNA by extension, excuse me there, but in the world. They wanted to prove that. And in a way, they, in a way, they kind of accomplished that in storyline, but even that ran its course. Even that ran its course... Um, after you know the you know the Good Brothers contracts of Impact came to an end, and basically you had Carl Anderson, you know, drop the Never Up and Wait Championship, you know, in his final New Japan appearance. You know, even after he was contractually, you know, uh, you know, contractually back with WWE. So, 
you know, so you had, you know, you, you, know, you had the situation basically to where, you know, essentially, you had the situation basically where essentially, um, you know, you had, you had a, you know, hold on for a second. Sorry, I almost had a brain fall. I almost got a little tongue tied there. But like I said, you had this situation to where the closest AEW got with that group, you know, that was done and, you know, done before people knew it. Yeah, it ran its course for about a year or so, almost a year, but it was done and pretty much, you know, over with before you knew it. It was. You know, it was. Now, why do I bring this all up? Why do I bring this all up? Because even with that, even with that, excuse me, even with that, you know, never once did you have a hostile takeover situation. You know, never once did AEW have to rely on that. But now here we are. Here we are and why people are making this comparison. You know, why they're making this comparison to the NWO. Because now we're getting into a storyline, you know, to what, you know, that we've seen several times before. You know, we're getting into a storyline that we've seen several times before to where it's basically now going to be Team AEW versus, you know, the elite, the new elite, or the NEO, if they're going to call themselves that. That's pretty much what I think they might play off of, of, hey, people think we're the NWO? They call us the new elite? Let's call ourselves the NEO, the new elite order. I would not be surprised if they do that. I would not be surprised. But again... Again, that's, you know, I know it sounds like I was rambling throughout all this. I do apologize. But again, you know, that, you know, again, this is why people are very questionable about what's going on here. I mean, some people might enjoy it and feel like, okay, this might be the shot in the arm AEW needs. Okay, fine. But where do you go from there after it's all said and done? You can't get CM Punk back. He's with WWE. Not unless Tony Khan makes a deal with, you know, Triple H swallows his pride and says, Hey, Hunter, um, let's make a deal. Is there a way I can get, you know, CM Punk to come back and do a match against Jack Perry and, you know, to put it close to the storyline and be done with it? You know, that, I mean, that would be the only way, I mean, that would be the only way Tony Khan might have a chance of getting CM Punk back, but I don't think it's going to happen because CM Punk don't want to be anywhere near the guy. He doesn't. He doesn't want to work for the guy, even if it's just a one-time deal. You know, he doesn't. So, you know, so basically what they have to do here now is rely on where they're going to go. Some are saying blood and guts is the ultimate goal. Okay, fine. But as we've seen, you know, but as we've seen, blood and guts over the year has been won by the baby faces, Right. This might be the year where the heels win, and they might be, and they might do it in a way that's very familiar as well when it comes to you know making comparisons to NWO, because a lot of people are saying Hangman Page, he's got to help lead Team AEW. Uh, yeah, uh, about that. Hangman Page is friends with the Bucks, right? You know, so who's to say he wouldn't turn on AEW? Get what I'm saying? People know already that if Hangman Page gets assigned to lead AEW against the new elite, he's going to turn on AEW. I mean, we've seen it before. Kurt Henning did it when he, you know, joined when, in war games when everybody thought he was WCW, full horseman, and he ended up being part of the NWO when that got revealed. You know, everybody thought Stone Cold, you know, when he did his thing, you know, doing the invasion angle. Everybody thought, oh, it's the old Stone Cold. He's back to being himself again. He's going to lead WWE. And what happened? He turns against them. So the moment Adam Page, I guarantee you, gets announced as part of Team AEW, and people are already projecting this as well, everybody knows he's going to turn against them. He, everybody can see that coming a mile away. He was already being set up to be a heel before he had to leave for personal reasons. So people can see it a mile away that when he comes back, he's going to align himself with the elite. We see it. And again, that would be another, you know, another copy and paste from the NWO angle, NWO inspired angles. You, you see what I'm saying? You see what I'm saying? The point I'm getting at is if they want to make this any different, 
you know, and, you know, not have a strong comparison to NWO. Because, again, you have that comparison of you have an outsider, you know, and someone in Jack Perry who ripped up his contract, calls himself a scapegoat and everything. Here you have Jack Perry basically, you know, kind of the de facto leader, I would assume, of the group along with Okada. You know, here you have him, you know, basically, you know, here you have him basically leading the charge against AEW and against Tony Khan and everything. He's pretty much compared to being like the Hogan, if you will, of the group. You know, him and Okada looked at as the Hogan, maybe the Bischoff of the group. And then you have the Bucks as the tag team, they looked at as the outsiders of the group. You kind of get what I'm saying? Kind of get what I'm saying? What I'm saying basically, long story short, what I'm saying basically, long story short, is, you know, they need to do something. They need to go down a path, you know, to where this whole new elite NWO-like story you know, has a conclusion sooner than sooner than what the plan, sooner than what people are expecting, so they don't get that, you know, so they don't get that long comparison for the next year or two to the NWO. That's what they need to do. You know, that's what they need to do. They need to do something that's different. Now, some people are saying that Mercedes, she retreated what happened to Tony Khan online. People are saying, well, what if Mercedes joins? Okay, fine. You have a female, represent, a female representative, you know, in your NWO-like stable, in your elite-like stable. Whoopee. But, again, even if you do that, it's not going to make a bit of difference. Oh, she's, she's now the de facto leader because she's the CEO. So what? So what? You know, it's not going to make a lick of difference. It's not going to make a lick of difference or anything unless they copy and paste what TNA did. And they basically have Mercedes reveal that when she signed her contract, she also had Tony Khan unsuspectedly sign away ownership of AEW to her. If they do that, then it pretty much shows you they're copy and pasting not only the NWO angle, but the immortal angle as well. So they got to do something that's different. And if that means basically doing this for the short term to try to get some attention on the product, then so be it. But they need to end it before it really starts, you know, um, you know, basically, I guess you could say, you know, what's, hold on for a second. Before it starts basically outliving its welcome, you know, they got to do something that, they got to do something that's going to prevent it from outliving its welcome a lot longer than it should. And whatever they come up with, it's got to be good. You know, if they're going to do this until Kenny Omega gets back, fine. But we don't know when Kenny's coming back, if he's coming back at all. You know, we don't know. We don't know if he's coming back yet. You know, we know he's going to probably have surgery, if not will have surgery for his situation. And we don't know how long that's going to keep him out. You know, we don't know how long that's going to keep him out and everything. But even if he comes back, you know, what are you going to do? You're going to do the question of, okay, where is, you know, where does his allegiance lie? And everything, you know, is that what you're going to do? Are you going to start doing that? Like, where does his allegiance lie and everything? You know, if you do that, then it's like, again, you're copying NWO. You know, B- NWO, NWO Spinal Storylines, beat for beat. Like I said, you're copying NWO, NWO Spinal Storylines, beat for beat. Now that you're going to do, what, for the second time in a row, maybe, a can we trust him because of his ties with the Bucks and Okada and all that? Is that, is that what's going to happen? Because if it does, people will already know possibly what one of the two answers are going to be. You know, so again, they got to do something that's going to be different, that's going to make them different. You know, that's basically going to conclude the storyline before it really, you know, it outlives his welcome. You know, that's what they got to do. You know, they just, they got to do something to where, even if it's short-lived, this whole new elite, NWO, elite-like story, you know, even if it's, you know, only for the short term up to the summer, you know, they basically, you know, they basically got to do, they basically got to do something to where, you know, 
it you know it leaves an impact you know you know pun intended it leaves an impact but they don't but afterwards they can rely on other things they can rely on other things that take place like you could do things that come out of it you know you can do things that come out of it like you know you get like if you do blood and guts you know you do blood and guts you have the elite lose you know if you have them lose then you could do an aftermath storyline wise you could have tony khan strip the bucks you know of the evp status and you can have them get punished. You can have Tony Khan say, I'm going to punish you by having you face different teams or different opponents that you're not aware of and you're not prepared for week after week to teach you a lesson. You could, you know, you could do something like that. And you know, basically, it could lead to the Bucks basically eventually turning face. I know that sounds weird, but by having the Bucks get punished, you know, after everything falls apart for them and for Okada and for Perry, you could lead to them going up against mystery opponents that beat their ass, and then eventually you have them finally admit they were wrong, and basically admit that the real reason, because I think this is another thing people are looking at as well, that the real reason they did this is because they want to stay in the tag team title picture. They don't want to be put at, you know, they don't want to be, you know, uh, ranked below, they don't want to lose their titles and then have to you know, be on the outside looking in. They want to stay in the tag team title picture all the time. And if that is one of the main reasons as to, you know, why they're, you know, doing this, then, you know, then eventually that's going to get revealed. And it might get revealed after everything comes crumbling down. It might get revealed as soon as next week. Who knows? But, but to me, you know, you got to have something planned. You got to have planned storylines set up for after this is all said and done. You got to have consequences for these four individuals, or five if Mercedes joins, or six if Mercedes and Hangman join. You know, you got to have consequences set up storyline wise. So, the way I'm looking at it, if they don't want to have a strong comparison to NWO and NWO inspired stories, you know, from other promotions, you know, they're, then they're going to have to make sure this is different enough to where, you know, not only does it, you know, do its job, even if it's for the short term, but the consequences that come afterwards lead to bigger stories later on and bigger character development for these individuals, you know, down the line as well. But, yeah, you know, they, they got to come up with a reason. I mean, I would not be surprised if they reveal, if Shad Khan, you know, confronts him next week, I would not be surprised if they reveal the fact that there's a fine print in a lot of the contracts, mostly the contracts of the former uh, talent that came up or came, you know, from Connecticut, came down from Connecticut, if you will, came down from Stanford. You know, I would not be surprised if they revealed that the fine print in those contracts of a Adam Copeland, a Brian Danielson, Maybe they even say his name. Maybe they say Phil Brooks when he was here and all that. Did those fine prints state that the only job of those individuals that made a name for themselves up there, that the only jobs when they become all elite is to put the elite and their friends over? I would not be surprised maybe if they you know, mention that, if that gets revealed. And, that, and if that does get revealed, then, hey, that's a new little twist we haven't seen you know, in any other NWO-inspired invasion storylines or take, hostile takeover storylines. You know, you have that little, you know, you have that little um, twist in there that, oh, yeah, Tony Khan, the fine print states that at people like Copeland and Danielson, you bring them in, that's great, great additions. But when they go up against us or our friends, they put us over. We don't do, not the other way around. You know, that could be a nice little twist. And that would play into the egos of the elite. And it would play into them stating that that's why all elite wrestling was created to put over the elite. You know, the elite, you know, themselves, not anybody else. You know, the elite and the friends and nobody else. They had that little twist. Yeah, it would be kind of expected or predictable, maybe in the eyes of some. But it would still be something a little different because you're playing into the ego of this group. Like, hey, your only job, Brian Danielson, your only job, Adam Copeland, you know, your only job, 
you know, Chris Jericho is to put us over, not the other way around. You know, they could do that. You know, they could even point it out to, like, you know, a John Moxley and a Claudio Castagnoli. They could say, the only job you guys have is to put us over, not the other way around. You know, so, you know, they do that. Again, it plays into the storyline, you know, not just the storyline itself of them embracing the EVP status, but it plays into, you know, uh, storyline and character-wise who they are. You know, when it comes to, you know, to wrestling and what they believe the company AEW is really about or should be about. So if they do that, that's a nice little twist. But even if that, even, <coughs> excuse me, excuse me, they had a little cough. But even, but even if they add that in there, which would be a nice little twist, you know, it's still not going to help if they drag this out in the long time, you know, for the long haul, I should say. It's not going to help out. So, because again, they have that. They're just gonna have to. Even if they add that little twist, this is not gonna be something they drag out for the long haul after that reveal. If it's something they do, but you know, it's something that they have to basically do for the short term to get people maybe tuning in to see what happens next. And that's about it. You know, that's about it. But we'll have to see. I mean, he has got people talking. They may not like how it came off last night. Heck, they may have not liked how Dynamite was presented, you know, at all last night from visual to audio wise. You know, so we'll see what happens. We'll see what happens. I mean, I know Tony, he's desperate to get that media rights deal with TBS and TNT done to remain on those networks and to possibly get that max streaming deal. But... We'll see, but we'll have to see if maybe this might help out. If it doesn't, then it's going to be back to the drawing board after the next few months. Because again, if this does not work, you know, over the next several months, you know, no matter if they add members or not, you know, or they reveal, you know, the real reasoning as to why they act the way they did and why certain talent is here in AEW and all that, you know, even if they do all that or not. You know, if there's no spike in the ratings and no attendance, you know, uppeting, if you will, with fans coming to the shows, then they're just, and then after a few months, they're going to have to come up with something different or just accept the fact that, you know, Tony, he's not going up against Vince McMahon anymore. He's going up against Paul Levesque, Triple H, and Triple H, Paul Levesque is out for blood. You know, he's out for blood, and we know it. And I think he knows it. So he's got he's to gotta hope this maybe works in his favor. If not, back to the drawing board after the next several months passes. So we'll have to see. I mean, it's got, like I said, it's got people talking, but not in the most positive you know, light, if you will. But let me know what your thoughts are. Let me know what your thoughts are, guys. Comment down below. Live chat during the premiere if you're watching on YouTube. I do apologize if this is a little bit of ramblish. You know, almost all over the place. I mean, that's kind of how people felt about, you know, Dynamite when they did their reviews. I mean, that's what Alex of Alex's Will felt last night when he did his recording for his thoughts on Dynamite. His recording was all over the place because that's how Dynamite was. But let me know what your thoughts are. Let me know in the comments below. Like I said, as well as in the live chat during the premiere if you're watching on YouTube. And until then, I'll talk to you all later.